Hey, welcome to another dispatch from Holly McKay. This is going to be a really good one because when Holly was in Afghanistan, she got to talk to the governor of Host, and the guy has a really interesting background, and he was one of the Gitmo Five. He got released in a prisoner exchange, and Holly, tell us, how did that journey go, and what did you find out? So Muhammad Amari, he is uh, one of the sort of the Gitmo Five. Uh, he spent 13 years in Guantanamo Bay as a as an accused sort of Al Qaeda terrorist, um, and he was released in I think it was 2014 that the Bogdal exchange happened. Um, anyhow, he is now the governor of Host, which is a province in Afghanistan. It's in the south. It borders Pakistan. Um, it's also the home uh, province of the Haqqanis, originally where that tribe came from. Um, so he has a very prestigious position. Um, however, so when I was in Afghanistan, I decided to go to Host. Um, there was a story that I wanted to work on looking at tunnels that uh, run between um, Afghanistan and Pakistan that allegedly the Haqqanis and Osama bin Laden used to send uh, suicide bombers kind of in and out of Afghanistan and Pakistan back in the 90s. Um, but first of all, I really wanted to go and meet uh, Muhammad Amari because of his, I guess, ties to the US um, and to see you know, what had become of this uh, man that was very controversially released uh, all those years ago and there was a if you remember uh, with the Bergdahl exchange there was a huge amount of controversy over it because uh, Bo Bergdahl was um, considered to be a deserter he left his post and um, pretty quickly was captured um, by the Taliban and held for about five years I think until this release happened um, but the release was very controversial because Basically, they were bringing home um, one American for five of these um, these these uh, alleged terrorists. Um, so I really wanted to see what had become of him. So we kind of just showed up at um, the sort of the governor's um, offices, if you will, in Host. Um, it's really challenging to make appointments with the Taliban because you never know where they're going to be, what they're going to do. It's very hard to function as a journalist because you can you know, get, um, you can, maybe you'll get a visa, but then you may not get a permission letter to work or you will be issued a permission letter from the foreign ministry and then you'll get to the local province. And so when you get to the local province, you have to go and meet with the, uh, the director there, or in my case, in this time, I went to meet with the governor, and they have to issue you a separate letter. So that it's a lot of uh, complication. Um, but I went to um, Muhammad Amri's office and of course, all you know the, the Taliban are there and staring at me because it was so strange for them to see a woman kind of coming into to do this work. And I waited sort of a long time. I think I remember falling asleep on the couch in his chief of staff's office. Um, and then eventually Muhammad Amri said, yes, he'll meet with me. And I was quite surprised because it's really becoming more and more challenging to get these interviews with Taliban officials. Most of them are have become... Um, kind of scared of talking to the media. In the beginning, they were a lot more open. Now it's just easier to say no and it's easier to reject visas and, and things like that. So I was quite surprised when he was very welcoming and I go into this office and it's a beautiful big room um, and he sort of, he doesn't look at me um, as a woman, but he, I sit down and he sort of says, you know, he welcomes me here as his guest and he's so happy that I'm here and that he'll, anything that's on my mind, we can discuss it. And basically I can ask him anything. And that was sort of a, a rare experience, I think, um, with the Taliban who are normally, it's very hard to, um, to convince them not only to sit down, but certainly to be willing to kind of talk about anything. And so we were sort of having a general chat about different relations uh, with the Taliban and what was happening inside the country. Um, and he brought up Guantanamo Bay himself and, and sort of started to tell me about his history and how he was, um, you know, and you know, from his lens, um, you know, he was sort of a community leader that was helping. And then one day he was summoned to, um, he thought he was going to meet with the American forces at a, I think it was an airport um, or somewhere that they'd asked him to meet. And he went sort of on his own volition. And that's where he ended up being um, taken in, arrested and eventually sent to Guantanamo Bay. Um, so he kind of explained to me, he, you know, when I asked about what happened, his life in Guantanamo Bay and and he 
he said, oh, you know, everybody uh, wants to me to write a book because, you know, you would never believe these things that had happened and, and everybody would be crying when they read it. And, he, and it was interesting because he also said, you know, he sees something and it's made by Americans and he hates um, he hates it if it's made by Americans. But on the same token, he recognizes the importance of the Taliban having a relationship uh, with the United States. And so I think his history, however that may be, he's sort of willing to to overlook that. And um, it seemed to me that he was more, it was more important to him to have a relationship with the US. And because the US is sort of, in his eyes, still the world leader. And once, if the US was to recognize the Taliban, then other countries would follow suit. Um, and so that was the most important thing to him. So it was just, it was a very sort of interesting um, exchange, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, the man is obviously far more candid than you know some of the other interviews that you have have run into and um your i mean your impression of like where he sits now there and the prestige that he has because he's he's also the guy on the front lines with pakistan and relationships with between afghanistan and pakistan and not really gone well since uh the the, the change in government and uh, so like it's I, a really mixed bag um i mean it's a really mixed bag so obviously what we know of the past 20 years during when the war was happening there that pakistan was obviously um enabling the Taliban to sort of still have their camps and have kind of a safe haven across the border in order to to uh, reconverse and get themselves strong enough for battle, which they certainly were. Um, but when the power shift happened, I think there was a lot of tension because suddenly the Taliban was back in power and suddenly the Taliban was very adamant it didn't want any country interfering with its internal affairs, whether that be the United States or whether that be Pakistan. And I think that was a big blow to Pakistan because they sort of thought they've spent two decades doing this, then they should have um, some kind of uh, leverage, if you will. And that hasn't really happened. And so when the particular uh, day that I was there, a comment had been made by a Pakistani official um, in New York, just a few days earlier, kind of saying that they were concerned that about, um, you know, Afghanistan and, and terrorism and things like that. And I mean, that caused a huge storm with the Talibs that were very angry and they certainly didn't mince words. And they demanded that Pakistan um, issue a, a rebuttal or take back those words and, and they wouldn't do it. And so that was sort of a huge fight. But I think more recently what I've seen, especially with the banning of education for girls, I think that unfortunately from my understanding from people on the ground, what we're seeing now is that the Taliban knows it's not going to get international recognition anytime soon, especially not in allowing girls to work, especially not allowing women to go to universities and work for NGOs. Um, and I think that is is actually Pakistan's influence um, on the supreme leader that we've never seen. Um, I think that is Pakistan's way of saying, don't worry, stop pursuing that stuff. You know, you can rely on us. Um, and that obviously is another big cause for concern. Um, I think that is actually now we're sort of seeing a different kind of strengthening of that relationship. But again, the Taliban is so fractured, um, it's sort of only that one sort of Kandahari branch that I think is fostering these strong relationships, whereas other um, parts of the Taliban that are loyal to different tribes and, and different places, they see this issue very differently. So it is complicated. Um, and the interesting part about this trip was after I met with um, Muhammad Al-Marie and he he said to you know, we asked, could you know we we need to travel another three hours to go to these tunnels? And he said, Yes, yes, you can go any way you want. Do you need um you need the Taliban to take you? Do you want an escort? Da, da, da. And we said, No, 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 we don't want that. You know, we're going on our own. Um, and that was fine. But when we got to the tunnels, of course, the local Talibs, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you here? We explained we had permission to be there. I'm going through the tunnels. And they said, you can't take pictures. I said, that's fine. And then as we were driving out, they sort of followed us and flagged us down. And that's when I ended up being detained because they thought that my Fitbit was a spy camera. And um, so that was sort of an uncomfortable um, 
uh, uncomfortable period of time where they take your passport and your bag and everything and you move cars and get moved from place to place and don't know where you're going. But eventually in the end, um, it was actually Muhammad Amari who came to my defense when they were eventually able to get hold of him. And, you know, we had no cell signal in the mountains. Um, and he was absolutely horrified and mortified that they had, you know, treated a guest this way. Um, and they sort of demanded that I get a room, that they tell them provide me the room and food and all these things, which I politely, <laughs> politely declined. I just, I needed to get back and get out of there at that point. But um, yeah, that is um, an interesting full circle. Someone who spent a long time in detainment um, was sort of the one that ended up coming to my defense. Yeah. Well, it's interesting what because that that actually does go that that whole guest foreign guests uh, behavior of that part of the world that which is cultural. Um, it's called Pashtun. It, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, that's also what got the Taliban in trouble back in in 2002 2003 and uh, they were insisting that the um, um al qaeda were guests and well, that they couldn't move on them either yeah, you know, i mean that so. hinged on and we, that hinged on the invasion i, I mean bush told Mullah Omar, who was head of the Taliban at the time, hand over bin Laden or, or we're coming in. And Mullah Omar said, he's a guest. You know, he's the only one who gave us money. We're not doing that. And so that's that sparked a, a very long and very bloody war. That The Pashtun yeah, Holy Code that can go multiple ways. Yeah. But, you know, by the same token, it got you out of a jam a heck of a lot faster than I thought when I got the text message from you saying I'm detained again. Free time is a charm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah, I don't know how many times that's happened already. But um, so closing comment because you and you started to to look at it. So this, I mean, you saw this guy back in what, October. And since then, as you noted, the the the, the Taliban has uh, begun to really crack down on uh what were some of the basics of the people we're looking for to see if they would conform more to international norms, particularly with things like like women. Uh, in the workforce and stuff like that or, or in education um and so today from what you've been able to discern um ha you know is is his pakistan's influence on afghanistan now becoming a dominant factor have they given up or like, where do you think that's going to go? Because it's, yeah, I mean, as it, I said, these to guys you, are definitely a, trying, right? Yeah, there's a strong contingency that will adhere to that. And it seems to me that whoever the Supreme leader is, has the ear of Pakistan. And I think that is um, obviously that has the most pull right now, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Well, that, that is their, they, they are their biggest trading partner. So, um, and money talks. So anyway, fascinating. I mean, um, for anybody that doesn't get story. it. Yep. Go check out the story. It's a yeah, yeah. funny conversation. Yeah. But um very much. And yeah, and I, I agree. People should check out the story because this is it's it was a very unique interview and one that is very, very rare in that part of the world right now. So it's definitely worth the read. Thank you, Holly, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs>